Hollowbrook Wealth Management is pleased to present this Ferrari side chat with automotive legend Wayne Carini in front of a live audience at One Drivers Club in Bedford Hills, New York. Let's hand it over to Philip Richter to kick things off. Wayne, I, I don't know where to begin. Um, Wayne is, for those of you who are not in the car world, um, Wayne is a legend in automobile circles. Uh, I, am, I am so honored to have you here today. I really appreciate it. We're all very grateful. You've become a great friend of mine, and you've been very inclusive to me in all the things we do at Pebble and all the fun we've had, and it's, it's been great. And it's an honor to have Wayne here on our home turf uh, in Katona. Um, thank you for agreeing to do this. The idea was a fireside chat, and instead it's a Ferrari side chat right behind us, an F40, even better, right. that's uh, Wayne's, the name of Wayne's business. And, uh, and I also wanted to thank Wayne for coming to the uh, fourth Turtle Invitational last fall. He uh, came and presented lots of awards on the podium, and it, it upped the game of the whole show to have Wayne's involvement. So thank you for that as well. So some background for all of you. Wayne's the only person in the collector car universe that has a global brand. This is a guy who owns a leading restoration shop, a body shop, and a classic car sales business. But if you Google his name on the internet, it comes back that he's a leading TV personality. That's what it says. So our, our goal today is to gain some insights into your journey. We want to learn how you literally turned a passion from your youth into an entrepreneurial empire and a global brand. I know the story, but for our guests here, many of whom don't know the story, how did your car passion start? Well, my dad, my dad uh, restored cars for a living when I was growing up. And so um, that was our lives. Um, basically, he worked seven days a week. Um, he, he formed and started the Model A Restorers Club of America in 1951, the year I was born because uh, he restored or fixed the Model A and he went to take it to a local car show and they refused to have him uh, enter the car because it was just some old used car. They were actually showing Duesenbergs and Packards and things and so he said, I'm gonna create a, a club that they can't come to. <laughs> and, and so he started the Model A club and a friend of his said, well, there already is a Model A club. He says, well, I'm a Model A restorer. I'll, I'm gonna start the Model A Restorers Club which I'm very proud, it's all over the world now. There's thousands of members of the club, and so it still, it still goes on after his, his passing. But he was a workaholic and a perfectionist. And um, through all of those hours of work, it, it started to pay off for him. You know, he's, he got really recognized all over the country for the quality of his restoration work. But um, growing up, um, there was no time for sports in my life. There was no time for anything because at eight years old, he put a piece of sandpaper in my hand and he put me on a fender like this and he says, go like this, you're hired. <laughs> and that's the way it's all started. Um, in, in third grade, uh, I, I had, for the summer, he had made me uh, rebuild the Model A engine. So uh, here I am in third grade and I've got an engine all apart. I put it all back together and I get it running. He just wanted me to go through that and, and, get, the, and get that knowledge, you know, and hands on. And so I went to, went to school. Now I'm in, in the fourth grade and the, and the teacher said, what did you do for the summer? I said, well, I rebuilt a Model 8 Ford engine. He goes, you did not. I go, I did. So I went back and I said to my father, I said, well, my teacher doubted me, Mr. Barnes. I always remember that. And he says, well, we're going to show him. So he brought the engine to, to school and they gave us a room and I tore the engine apart and I put it back together in, in a three At day. At what age? Um, well, it was, it was in fourth grade. So what, what's that? 10? Yeah. 10, 11. 10, 11, something like that. So uh, that gave me a, a big boost in confidence, knowing that, you know, I could do something like this um, without a lot of help from my dad or my cousin. But we, we grew up in Glastonbury, Connecticut on a farm. Uh, we had a 350 acre farm that my uncles and, um, and my grandfather owned and it was a fruit farm. So I got to drive tractors when I was very young. As soon as my feet were able to touch the pedals, they, they hired me to do that. 
and I'd be going up and, and with all, collecting all the baskets for the apples and peaches and pears. Um, so the driving, you know, having a vehicle and being able to drive at a very young age was something that was really inspiring too. But um, the work ethic that all my family had, I think really is what really pushed me to be the best you could be and to do nothing but hard work. And, it, and that's what it took. It just took up hard work. I'd go with my, my uncles to the market and sell the apples and peaches and pears. And we'd get up at two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and we'd load the truck up and we'd go to the, go to the market. And my biggest reward was having breakfast at seven o'clock once all the stuff was gone. Who could have said that? But, you know, that's, I think that, that that was the one thing. My father became very famous doing his restorations and I was very proud. Um, and I don't know how many people know what Hershey, Pennsylvania is, but Hershey was the biggest car show and, and um, in the country at that time, Hershey, Pennsylvania. And my dad went in 1957 for the first time and in 58 he took me well i'm seven years old and i'm going to this big huge car show so when i was 10 though um he put a sandwich board sign around my neck with all the parts he was looking for and he sent me out into the flea market now this is huge this is not like a parking lot or anything this is a huge thing and he put a crayon in my pocket and said now go out and and find these parts and Here's a crayon so the person can write their space number down that has the parts and then come back at lunchtime and we'll go look for them. So you can imagine a 10 year old just being left free. I mean, that you know, would be hundreds of, I mean, they'd protective would have, services yeah, would be after them today. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But those type of things, I mean, I found a certain part, I found some wheels for a Saxon Roadster that he was really looking for. And I, I got two ice cream cones that night. I mean, yeah, that, was, that was the so reward. The, the, the genesis of chasing classic cars, you could almost go back to that field in Hershey when you were 10 years old, yeah. finding those Saxon wheels, right? And then, and then, of course, you know, my father restoring classic cars and Model A's and stuff, I was sort of, you know, really honed on that type of car, that era car. But then my cousin um, on the farm had a lean-to and he built hot rods in that lean-to. And so I was the beer guy, you know, I was, you know, go give me a beer, uh, that guy, go give me a half inch wrench, whatever it was. And he and his buddies would sit around and smoke cigarettes and drink beer and build hot rods. And then up the street, about a mile away was Candy Pool Sports Car Shop, very famous uh, sports car shop in the whole United States. And he built a, a car that a lot of people know that know uh, racing at Lime Rock, the PBX. And my father re uh, painted that car. And so I got into s foreign cars at that point. Candy Pools had Ferraris. At that point? Oh, probably 10. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ride, ride my bicycle over there and, and look at the cars and, and hang out and listen to a lot of things. And I knew the guys because my father was friends with them. So they knew me. They just welcomed me into the shop. So that's what really sparked the interest, you know, and then reading all the magazines and going to Franklin Pharmacy and getting road and track magazine and looking at it mr silverglide going if you're not buying that put it yeah. back <laughs> those things just always stick in your mind you know and then following formula one and um and indy car racing you know it was and uh riding bicycles and building bicycles but finally building a car um which i did probably about 12 years old i, I restored a car by myself as a summer project what what car was in it? It was the Saxon that we got oh, the window. Saxon. Yeah, that we got the wheels for. Yeah. So, do you still have that car? No, that's quite the story. I I hadn't finished the project totally, and so it sat in my in my garage for years. And my father one day said, "Why don't you give me that car back, and I'll finish the restoration for you?" Yeah, sure. So I gave him the car back, and so one day I go to his shop, and I said, "By the way, where's the Saxon? I'd like to see it." He says, "I sold it." <laughs> He gave it to me and he took it back and sold it. But that's the way it goes. If you don't finish things, I guess that's what happens. So, I, you know, we're curious, you know, at Hollowbrook, we think about this a lot in managing companies and, and what drives entrepreneurs to excellence and, and hard work. Like you talked about, your dad had this work ethic. Is there anyone else besides your dad who was a mentor for you or that sticks out in your mind that they, they did something that you wanted to emulate and, 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 and be part of? I think that happened, um, you know, to me during a, my childhood, you know, hanging out with all these famous people like, you know, my 
uh, Candy Pool that won a lot of races. He'd go to Sebring every year. I thought that was the coolest thing, knowing somebody that was doing that kind of stuff. Um, but my, you know, looking up to my elders, my uncle Al was just, he was the greatest guy in the world and, and, I, and I hung out with him a lot. I think hanging, uh, hanging out with a lot of young people is good, but hanging out with old people, you'll learn a lot, you know. Um, and so I, I think that had a lot to do with it too. And we grew up in Glastonbury on a street where all of my cousins lived. So, it, you know, it didn't matter. My, wife, my mother would let us out the door at seven o'clock in the morning and say, just don't be late for dinner. And, and so, you know, she had no idea where we were all day, but she felt comfortable and that the whole street was sort of family. And that, I think that had a lot of do, things to do with it too. Yeah, you can't do that type of stuff today. But the, the, I think the one person that, and, and several people that had a, a big impression on my life is, is I was in my 20s. One was a good friend of a lot of us here, uh, Francois Sicard. Francois, uh, I looked up to Francois when I was restoring Ferraris and I thought that he was God. You know, he was like the ultimate guy. He said very few words and most of them were in French, swearing. Um, <laughs> But I learned from him and I became such close friends of his and, and he taught me a lot. We were at a car show once and I'd restored a 275 four cam and he restored a 500 super fast and we were in competition next to each other. And I looked at his car, I looked at my car and said, I got this beat. I got him done. This is good, you know, and he beat me. Yeah. And after he came over and he says, you know, you do beautiful body work and paint. You know nothing about hose clamps. And I go, well, what do you mean? He opened the hood of my car. He says, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. He says, from now on, I do host clamps. You do body and paint. We win every time together. <laughs> and we became a partnership uh, restoring cars together. Wow. And then, of course, uh, um, Luigi Canetti Sr., Luigi Canetti Jr., getting to know those guys. Um, and there was one guy, though, that really pushed me to be that entrepreneurial spirit and, and, to, and to really be off on my own. That was Herb Chambers. I don't know if many of you might know Herb sure. Chambers, big Herb, car dealer in Boston. Herb started off as uh, a copy, copying company based in Glastonbury, Connecticut. And he he never graduated high school, uh, went in the Navy, came out, was a bartender at his aunt's bar and hated it and worked uh, repairing copy machines at night in Boston. Came to Hartford with $500 and a 59 Volkswagen. Um, and uh, started going to all the insurance companies and repairing their copy machines. And uh, he grew the company into, um, he sold the company for um, $80, billion, $80 million uh, several years later. But it was his drive and his, you know, excellence. He wanted everything to be perfect and excellent. And, and how he expanded himself and, and, um, and his company became a car dealer. He wanted me to go to work for him and run all of his body shops. And I said, Herb, you and I are good friends. I don't want to ruin that for anything in the world. So let's stay friends. And today we're still great friends. And he owns 60, I think he's up to 65 car dealerships now. You know, but that's what it takes. And he did that because he, he started in the car business because he, he had sold a copy and felt kind of cool, you know, and he said, I'm going to go buy myself a new Cadillac. And so he went to the Cadillac dealership in New London, Connecticut, and he walked in and he, he said, is there anybody here I can help me? I want to buy a new Cadillac. And, and the woman at the desk said, well, everybody's out to lunch at the moment. Um, <laughs> they'll be back in about a half an hour. So he waited and he said, while he was waiting, he says, I should buy this company. This is ridiculous the way it's run. She goes, I wish you would. <laughs> and he did. Came back and she, she said, um, Mr. Chambers would like to buy a Cadillac and would like to buy this company. And the guy says, come in my office, Mr. Chambers. <laughs> and, uh, and within an hour, we, they came to an agreement. And that was his first dealership. And now he's 60, over 60 dealerships. Yeah, that's an empire. So I think, you know, looking at things, and there was another guy, Charlie Warner. He was an insurance salesman. And he always told me, he says, you know, if, if perfection and, and being the best you can be, is it, he says, sell yourself first have people appreciate you for what you are and what you do, he says, and you could sell them anything. You could sell them a dag of, bag of dog poop, but make sure it's the best damn dog poop in the world. <laughs> and I think that that's really, is, 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 well, is that one-on-one -on -one with people. That, that's, that's interesting because um, I'm involved with the Malcolm Prey Foundation and Malcolm's um, granddaughter, Courtney, is here, who also 
runs a body shop, uh, Prey Auto Body in Stanford, if you need body work, not a commercial, but she does the best work. But Malcolm believed that very much too, that the, the exact same thing about, you know, selling yourself and, and, and that. Um, and it, it, it's interesting, you, one of the stories I love that I've heard about you is that you um, got a ride in that short wheelbase 250 Ferrari and it changed your life. It Can really you just did. mention, just even So we, we would go up into the Adirondacks uh, on vacation every year to one of the resorts up in the Adirondacks. And um, we, we went to the same place for probably five years and it was the one thing my father would go for four days, no longer because he had to go back to work. But four days we would go up as a family. And uh, the cabin next to ours, there was a doctor from New York, and I was about 10 years old, and he had uh, a 250 GTE one year, and the next year he had a 250 short wheelbase. And I looked at that car, and I just, it just, it just excited me as is, is, is an 11-year-old. I mean, I said, oh, my God, I can't believe it. He opened the hood, and it's got two distributors. It's got two oil filters. It's, it's, it's got everything. It's, I, I thought it had to be the best car in the world. And then he said, ask your dad if it's okay to take a ride with me. And I took a ride, and, and it's still today, that's my favorite car in the world. You could take every other car away in the world, just give me that one car, and I'd be totally satisfied. Well, we, we see at the uh, Prey Achievement Center what Malcolm Prey did. Most collectors, they hoard their cars, and they don't share them. They don't want them scratched. They don't want, them, they don't want kids near them. Malcolm was an evangelist of success, and when he was alive, and even to this day, Mary Kay, our executive director is here, Malcolm always believed the kids had to sit in the car, and we were targeting mostly underprivileged kids who had never seen, uh, you know, let alone a Chevrolet, forget about a Ferrari and all the other cars, he had Bugattis, and, and Malcolm really believed, and I still think it's true to this day, that we changed the lives of a lot of the kids from that same experience level where they were able to be treated like adults and sit in a car that was the car of their dreams and change their life. And well, we get a lot of people that come into the showroom and, and, you know, they're always telling their kids, don't touch the cars. I said, why? They can touch them. Oh, how can you let them touch them? I said, it's a car. It's paint. They can clean it. It's not a big deal. You know, if you have a diamond ring and you're going and testing the paint, well, that's one thing. But... Um, and we let the, the kids sit in the cars. We take pictures. I mean, I do that at car shows too. I just bought a fire truck and my wife said, why did you buy it? I said, so kids could climb all over it and have fun. I mean, you know, she says, well, that's the biggest excuse I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Well, you know, so we talk about this a lot at Hollowbrook. A lot of the things you've mentioned as far as passion, purpose, value, work ethic, all those things. What core values, if you had to identify one or two core values that have really been the drivers of your business success, what might that be? Perfection. Um, and, 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 and every car that leaves has to be the same. It has to be perfect. And, and there's, there's no excuse not to have perfection. When my father, when we restored cars and we took them to especially Hershey, he was such a perfectionist that the name on the hubcap, let's say it's, it's Duesenberg, it had to be perfectly horizontal and the valve stem had to be perfectly st st uh, sticking up on the bottom of the tire. So the horizontal and then the valve stem. And then what we did is we took a jack and we would turn the wheels, each wheel, so that it, it sat. So all the names were perfectly straight. Um, that kind all, of perfection. All the cotter pins had to be going in the same direction. Um, all the screws had, the heads of the screws had to be going. And if you go around a windshield, the screw head had to follow the direction. So these are small things, but they make such a big deal. And that's what I look for when I'm looking at a car is those little things. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we talk a lot at Hollowbrook about excellence because what we see in the world, and, and this is a terribly general statement, but excellence is sort of becoming a dying Thing in a lot of industries where quality control isn't what it used to be, quality in general, attention to detail, those types of things. How, how do you define excellence like in your business? I mean, obviously, making sure the car is exactly right. If someone, if someone famous is buying a car from you or not famous, you want it, it doesn't matter, you want the car perfect. Well, but, you know, I, I think that I always say that if I'm happy, you're going to be happy with, with the car. And I make sure that I'm happy. If, I, if, if, if it's not right, I, I can't sleep at night. You know, I'll, I'll think about it, you know, all night and try to figure out, you know, how to make it so that it is perfect. 
And per perfection is just in the eye of the beholder, too. You know, I mean, and any car could be perfect to a lot of people where I, I could find a lot of faults with it. That's why I don't judge cars. Very seldom do I, am I a judge. I, I gave up the opportunity of being a judge at Pebble Beach because I don't want to tell somebody that they've got a car that's incorrect. It's their baby. It's their, it's their passion. Why should I put them down for what they're doing? You know, so I'm, I'm a poor judge. I'm a good judge of character, put a poor judge at a car show. Thanks. What about, um, you know, we always, we always like to talk about the great things in life and the successes, but what about setbacks? Like, I don't know if you could talk about just, you know, a massive setback that you had in your life, either professionally or personally, but that required that, that work ethic you've talked about, that perseverance. You know, uh, out of high school, um, I went to Pratt Institute of Technology uh, in, in New York, and I was, I was damned to be an architect. And I was so excited that I was able to do that and go. And I, I, I was in the Hartford Home Builders Association, young architect, future architects, and, they, and I, I won for my design and my building and my, that I presented. And so I'm all of a sudden going to be an architect, and I applied to Pratt, and I got accepted. And I got there, and it was the biggest disappointment in my life because I had pictured my life as being an architect and designing all these very unusual houses and stuff. And I found out that it wasn't like that at all. <laughs> um, you, had to, you had to go to school for seven years, and, and, uh, and more than likely you'd end up at a, at, a, at a boat factory designing boats or something like that, that very few people had that opportunity and that perseverance to really push through and so i came home at christmas break and i never went back <laughs> that was it and so i ended up graduating art education which gave me that same type of of rewards and then uh, couldn't find a job i liked after that and so i went back to work for my dad and that gave me that reward back so i think the biggest one of the biggest disappointments was is that really i i realized and it was good that i realized it early on that it wasn't for me but it really disappointed me. But one of the biggest setbacks in, in, in my life was uh, a part of my family. So I married my lovely wife, uh, Lori, and we had two great children. And then uh, my, our second daughter, Kimberly, at age uh, 18 months, um, stopped talking one day. And then she stopped interacting with us. And um, seven or eight months later, we, we found out that she really had autism. And so that was a real blow to the gut, you know, that how could this happen to us? And um, what really made a big difference was going to the meetings, the autism meetings, and they were held at the Children's Hospital in Hartford. And you'd go through the ward to get to the meeting room and you'd see children who were dying of cancer. And you'd see children with no limbs. And you would think, boy, I tell you what, I got a problem, but I, I don't have any problem next to that. And so I think that that really woke you up to, yeah, okay, we got problems, but people got worse problems in the world. And so um, it, it was a setback, um, but it made our family stronger. It made uh, our marriage stronger. And um, people always say, would you, what would you change? Uh, would, would you want Kimberly to be any different? I said, no, I love her for what she is. And she's the person that, you know, she's so special, it's unbelievable. So I think that that's, setbacks sometimes look terrible in the beginning, but it's all, it's, it's all, it's, it's like a bump in the road. How do you approach that bump in the road? How do you take it? How do you experience it? And, and I think that that made us, made me a stronger person and, um, and, and really renewed my, uh, my, the way I felt about, people in life. You know, I had, a, I had a very good friend, Kevin Corsi, that uh, was in a terrible um, Christmas Eve fire. The, the Christmas tree fe uh, uh, caught on fire in his home, and he was burnt terribly. And we were just such close friends, and uh, he was so disfigured. But to me, he was still Kevin. You know, uh, it was nothing. I'd go over and play with him, and, 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 but when we went out in public, it, it was, I, I saw fear in people's faces when they saw him, this disfigured person. And I'd get uh, so upset at him. I go, what, it's just Kevin. What are you talking about? You know, I didn't really, couldn't con conceive what was going on, you know. 
So experiences like that, I think, make you a stronger person. Well, it certainly comes through in your reputation because everyone in the car world knows how you put your family first all the time. Actually, even at the Turtle Invitational, uh, Wayne came uh, and gave out a lot of awards, but you had to leave because you were going back up to Connecticut to go kart racing, I think. Go kart racing. Go kart racing. <laughs> With my grandson. With your grandson. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, that, that's just, it's, um, it, it follows you. People know that about you and people are very aware of your daughter and all you've done with that. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and it's given me an opportunity um, to speak about autism and, and explain it to people and, um, and, and, and raise a lot of money for different charities. I'm very proud of that. Um, but it all comes back to just that experience. And now how can I explain it to people? How can I give back? One of the weirdest parts was is that we found out that she had autism. We'd go to all these meetings and stuff, but the movie Rain Man came out. And, and Rain Man, t to us as a family, meant so much because it sort of explained to the world that didn't know what autism was before, what it was. You know, my wife would go to the grocery store and, and somebody would say, well, what's wrong with your daughter? Well, she has autism. Can I catch it? <laughs> you know, that type of thing, you know. So uh, the movie came out, Rain Man. It was great for the autism community because it sort of explained it. It's, it's about two years later um, that I get a Buick comes in and, and it's a 49 Buick Roadmaster, like the one in the movie. Like the one in the movie. Yeah. It comes in, it rolls out of this trailer and I said, who's this? this? He says, I don't know, the, but you'll get a phone call. So this woman called me from California. She said, my boss would like you to restore his car. I said, I got a weird thing to ask you, but this looks just like the Rain Man car. She goes, that's because it is. Barry Levinson. Yeah, Barry Levinson watches your show all the time and wants you to restore the car. He bought it after the movie. So we restored the car for Barry. Um, I delivered it to his house and he said, I just sold the house. I have no place to put it. Can you store it for me? That was 12 years ago. <laughs> He's still... He still owns the car. I've tried to buy it several times. But the deal I made was I'd store it for nothing as long as I could use it to promote autism charities. So the car's been all over the country to promote autism charities, and it's, it's a really fantastic thing. It's down at the Savoy Museum in Cartersville, Georgia right now in a movie car class that they're doing down there. So, yeah, so uh, things, good things happen, that's for sure, you know. And, and, it, and it's, again, all in how you, you know, Take the bumps in the road. That's, that's what it is. Well, we, we, uh, Hollowbrook is going to be making a donation to Autism Speaks uh, in, in your honor and, 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 and thanking you for doing this today. Um, is there anything anyone should know about Autism Speaks as an organization? Well, actually, that... I, 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 um, I've raised money for Autism Families Connecticut, it's called. Mm -hmm. I used to raise money for Autism Speaks, and we had a little disagreement about uh, how much money the top person there makes and how, how come he makes so much money and was, should, should be a charity. So I, I decided to uh, go with local charities. So wherever I give talks, I, I donate the money to a local autism charity, but Autism Families Connecticut, um, we really enjoy that because they, they uh, created a program uh, for Kimberly. It's, it's got my daughter Kimberly's name on it for young adults and adults with autism because what happens is everybody's focusing on young people as they're growing up <clears throat> and then once they get to 21, everybody sort of goes away. Oh, you know, there's no more programs for them. There's nothing that, that goes on for them. So Autism Families Connecticut has a program for young adults and adults with autism. So it's named after Kimberly. So that's great. Yeah, great. Well, yeah. so thinking about your career, and I know a lot of people in the audience uh, watch Chasing Classic Cars. I still watch reruns. I have them going on in my garage kind of on a loop because I love it. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs have trouble kind of with their next act, right? You've been so successful in a lot of different ways. What does the next five years look like? And, and what are you thinking about in your future? I know, I know Bob Scanlon's here, and I know a little yeah, bit about Speed Vision, but... We didn't, we didn't touch on how Chasing Classic Cars started, so uh, maybe we, we, yeah. we talk about that a little bit. So here I am, I've got a restoration shop, and everything's going good, and, and I buy a Hudson Italia. A Hudson Italia that I, that I chased since I was 16 years old and I bought it when I was 52 years old. The same car. And... Uh, Wait, can I... <clears throat> how did you 
first see it when you were 16? My, fa my father uh, fixed the fender on it. It had a little scratch in it. And he worked at Pratt & Whitney at night on second shift. Restored cars during the day and worked at Pratt & Whitney at night. And um, the guy that owned it was, was a, a fellow employee with him. So he brought it to my father. And when other kids wanted Camaros and Mustangs, I wanted a Hudson Italia. Don't ask me why, I just liked unusual cars. So I chased the car from when I was 16, tried to buy it. I finally bought it when I was 52. Donald Osborne, who a lot of you may know from Jay Leno's show, has been a great friend of mine for over 45 years. And he wrote an article that appeared in the New York Times about that chase, that pursuit of that car. And Jim Ostrowski from uh, uh, Crashing Wave Productions read that on Sunday and called me on Monday morning and said, I'd like to do a TV show about you. And I go, what? Who are you? And he explained he was doing stuff for Discovery Channel, and they were looking for automotive content. So I, um, he, he came up and he talked to me for a half an hour. I said, how much does it pay? He says, absolutely nothing, but you never know what can happen. So we, we did two uh, one-hour specials, uh, one called uh, Monterey Week, and the other one called the world's most expensive car. And then Shauna, who was uh, Discovery's um, uh, programming expert came to Monterey with us and we went to the Jet Center and we were sitting there and we didn't have a contract with them yet we just had two specials that we had done and so we we went to the Jet Center uh, with Gordon McCall's party yeah there's 3,000 people there so we're sitting on the couch and Sean is asking me some questions and I said so I said do you like cars and she goes not really she says uh, we're into more sports my husband's in the football so what team? She goes, oh, the Miami Dolphins. And she shows me a picture of her little son with a dolphin shirt on. She excuses herself to go to the ladies' room. I'm sitting there on the couch by myself, and I looked over to my right, and Don Shula is sitting next to me. <laughs> Honest to God, this is like unbelievable. So I said, Mr. Shula, what are you doing here? So we talked for a minute. She came back, and I said, oh, Sean, I forgot to introduce you to a really good pal of mine. This is Don Shula. She went crazy. She, and she had stated during the day that I knew a lot of people. She, she says, now I know you know everyone. <laughs> and so the, the very next day she came and she said, I, um, I want to have you do uh, an episodes of, of a, a show. You can call it anything you want. We'll give you uh, 10 episodes a year and uh, you're on your own. But I just want to warn you, your life's about to change. And I said, why is that? And she goes, well, everybody will get to know you, who you are. And I go, yeah, right. Sure they will. Well, it's crazy. I mean, I couldn't go in the grocery store anymore. People try and take pictures of me buying, you know, well, I've shrimp. Heard, I've heard stories when you land in the airport in Rome, people maul you. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I always remember the time that, you know, I, I, went, I went in the men's room at, at you know, Baltimore Airport, I think it was, and, and a guy standing behind me, and I said, can I help you? He says, I just wanted to take a picture with you. <laughs> 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 Not here, pal. <laughs> But it, it, it's, it's truly amazing, I mean, people. And then, of course, um, with Velocity, uh, Discovery showed the, the show all over the world. So we're in a, over 100 countries now. My voice is dubbed, I think, in 36 languages. Um, Valentino Balboni says to me all the time, he says, you know, in, in Italy, you're more famous than the Pope. So, so for those of you who don't know, Valentino Balboni is the most revered test driver for Lamborghini really of all time he he's drove a, every car every he's driven every car <clears throat> he's very famous in the car world that's a great content comment it's a fantastic <laughs> comment so that's great yeah um so so so, yeah. the, so the future um so chasing classic cars is is done filming um we couldn't agree to a contract with motor trend so um so we went out and said okay we're, we're going to do some other things so i started uh, coming up with some ideas so we have a show that we're going to be start filming soon called On the Road with Wayne Carini. Who knows, uh, On the Road with Charles Corral. We'll, 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 yeah. we'll test everybody's age in the room. Yeah, sure. That's what it's gonna be. We're gonna go around and talk to people in just communities. We're gonna go to a diner and ask who's the biggest car person in, the, in, in town, and we'll go talk to that person and ask them about how they got into cars. So a little, uh, yeah, we, can, we can do that. And then we're gonna be doing a show uh, where we analyze um, car auctions. And part of it is Lowell's, Lowell Paddock is part of that uh, the show with us, where we analyze car auctions. We tell you what's been going on in, in the car auction, the prices and stuff. So 
we're doing that, but we're, we're doing something, uh, and, and just before I say that, um, I, I, this, this year will be my 40th straight Pebble Beach. Um, you haven't missed a year in 40 and, years. Not have not missed a year except for because of COVID. So last year I had to go because of COVID, otherwise it would have been last year. I've actually been to Pebble Beach 48 years because I used to go as a kid. Um, and I know it's 40 because we got married, my wife and I, and she goes, you stopped going to Pebble Beach when we met. How come? And I said, well, because we met, we were hanging out. She goes, please go back. <laughs> so it's been, I've been married 40 years. Um, just about six weeks ago was our anniversary. And, uh, and, but this is my 40th year, and I think, uh, I, th I think that's it. I'm going to be starting to do more things going to Europe. Uh, I want to go to Goodwood. I want to go to Villa Dest. I want to go to Aston. I want to do a lot of things in Europe. South America, the people, I mean, I, I get invited to so many events in South America because the show is so popular down there. So, and I want to do the uh, Mille Mille, um, and I want to do the London to Brighton and finally finish it. I know you had a breakdown. We did, but we, I, we're going to go back and finish that. But one of the most exciting things was is that when Motor Trend bought Velocity, um, Bob Scanlon, who's here with me today, said he was retiring. And I know Bob fairly well. We'd been working together for about 18 years. And I said, I know you're not retiring, so when you figure out what is next in your life, I want to be part of it. So Bob called me about two years ago, and he said, how would you like to own Speed Vision with me? Now, Speed Vision, as we all know, a lot of us, started automotive programming. Bob is the person that started that with Roger Warner at ESPN. And uh, then uh, Fox bought it. It moved on to Fox Sports 1 and, and, and Speed first, and then Fox Sports 1. So um, Bob went on to Discovery Channel and started uh, HD Theater, which was the channel that I started uh, on. And then he started Velocity, and that's when we really ramped it up. And, and um, the past four or five years, uh, last four or five years of Chasing Classic Cars, we were doing 24 episodes a season, which I have no idea how I found that much content to do, but to, but being on the road about 180, 190 days a year and in hotel rooms was getting pretty tiring. Yeah. And so I said, you know what, it's probably a good time to stop chasing classic cars. So the new car shows will be a little more like maybe we'll do a year, something like that and, and do the other show too. So, but one of the biggest things is, is that I'm part of the ownership of Speed Vision, which is very exciting. So, uh, Bob, why don't you come on up? And, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Scanlon. So, Bob, you, you started Speed Vision. What year was that? 1995. 95, and in 2001, we sold it to Fox. They then made it Speed Channel. Then it morphed into Fox Sports 1. Ironically, the sister channel was Outdoor Life that got sold to Comcast that then became NBC Sportsnet that now is in the dark. So, but I thought I would give you a quick primer on what it's like being in a crowd with this guy. Wayne Carini, love your show. <laughs> Can I have a picture? He never, ever, ever says no. This guy is the most generous, gracious ambassador for this hobby that you could ever ask for. He never says no. He never gets frustrated. People will come up. And, you know, once, once it starts, with me as a producer, it's like it's a conga line, right? So people see it. They start lining up. And then I'm grabbing my phone saying, uh, emergency, emergency. We got to go. We got to go. Ambulance, something or other. We got to go to the hospital to get him out of that. But Wayne has been so great and he's so great to work with. His expertise, you know, his, his attention to detail, his attention to excellence is exactly like what we look for. I, I would say, I echo everything you say. And I would also say that as the hobby turned into an industry, it didn't really have an ambassador, right? And, and Wayne has been that ambassador as the, as the hobby morphed into a multi-billion dollar industry. And that very fact of, I've seen Wayne after long days at Pebble where people want pictures and you're always just kind with all these people. And I know you're exhausted because I'm dying because, you know, after the fifth day of Pebble, you're cooked and finished. But that makes a huge difference for 
people who want to get into the sport or the hobby or the industry. And it does, we need every it, every know, industry needs a great the, ambassador. The one thing you were you were mentioning how it uh, it grows once one person does it. So we were filming a Pebble one year, and Jim Ostrowski, who owned the company, was the cameraman that year. And we were trying to get some filming done, and, and the people are surrounded. You know, it's sort of like Jay Leno or anybody. You know, the, the people flock around you. And and Jim, he, he put the camera down on the ground, and he walked out. He just he left. And and my producer Hannah standing there, and she, I said, "Did Jim just leave?" Yeah. You think he'd be back? And she's just no. <laughs> so she picked the camera up, and we finished the day. And and but you know it, it became frustrating to to her, but to him. But to me, you don't have that. You're not you're not having a show unless you are great to your fans. You have to be kind to your fans, yeah. no matter what. Right. And you that's know, we have a we have a client at the firm who. Uh, is is in the auto industry in the in new car sales and he told me a story his dad was driving him along the Merritt Parkway he was a young boy and his dad turned to him and he said you know it's it's the key to success in business is how you make other people feel and i I've, I've never forgotten that like that's and and that's what you've done in the industry with shaking those hands and taking those pictures i mean i see with a lot of kids too and and that just is it's so unusual today it is and and you know in in this business and i i've been i was at espn for 15 years in charge of motorsports and then did a stint at the nfl but i ended up at uh we did speed vision and outdoor life i ended up at discovery which is where i met wayne doing velocity and so on but one of the keys this formula that i have because you can imagine the number of submissions for shows that we get. We get hundreds of submissions for shows and they are virtually all the same. Synopsis is, I'm Bobby Joe Jones and I run the biggest, baddest shop in all of America. And this is Sally. She runs a shop, she kicks everybody's butt and she looks like a calendar girl. And this is Victor, he's the village idiot. And then Jimmy does all the hard work and this is our shop. That's, I'm not kidding you, that's the tape. So the formula that we've used is what I call the beer test. And it's very simple. We get submissions. You see how these people are, guys and girls on camera. And if you say, I would have a beer with them, they pass. That's the hurdle. It's none of this other contrived stuff about throwing wrenches and the clock is ticking and all that stuff. So Wayne and I have uh, uh, embarked on this new renewed speed vision it's uh it's a whole new world in this television business you know tradition most of you know traditional cable is on the decline we are in this space that's called free ad supported tv which is good for this group it's called fast and we are on connected tv so primarily connected tvs we're in 22 countries on 15 different streaming platforms continuing to grow we're out now I need to get, uh, you know, we need to raise some capital to get Wayne a new series and some other things and to get into original. We have 800 hours of programming, but we really need to get into more original programming, let Wayne take off across the country, do his show and so on. So that's where we are. I could not be more excited about this opportunity. I've done it three times before. And I did it at ESPN, we did it at Speed Vision, we did it at Velocity, and we're gonna do it again. And it's because of people just like this guy who is the prototype of the best host, the best expert, the most authentic, and so on. So I hope you all tune in and we'll watch. Great. So thank you, Bob. We, we wanted to have some time for Q&A. I think, Wayne, you've got to get to Hartford and get him to the airport and a lot of stuff going on. But yeah, we got a few minutes for Q&A. Um, are there any questions? Yep, there we go. I thought we'd be... Well, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Crini. I'm um, Mary Kay Satriano, the uh, director of the Malcolm Prey Achievement Center, where we definitely take 10-year-olds seriously. Um, as you may know, uh, Malcolm Prey saw the Delahaye at 10 years old, and pretty much the rest is history. 
um, would like a question and and an offer to you. This is about as close as I'm ever going to get to uh, Pope Francis. So, um, <laughs> your affection and your admiration for your father comes through so authentically. What would you advise young fathers and all fathers, perhaps, to have their children be able to say the same thing you did about your own dad years from now? And the other would be, what would you have me say to 10 and 11 year olds to inspire them to succeed? And lastly, should you need any help in Central America, my in-laws are here from Tegucigalpa. So if you need right. any assistance in that region, just let us oh, know. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you know, the, the one thing it, it, that is so important, um, and I learned this growing up with all my family around me, is spend time. That's, that's basically, a, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be doing anything special. It's just spending time with a young person and then introducing them to cars. And so my, my grandson, who's eight years old, Connor's, Connor's fabulous. We spend a lot of time together as much as possible. So he loves, he loves cars. So when he was five, I said to him, what do you want more than anything in the world from pop-up today on your birthday? He says, I want to go for a ride in the Pierce Arrow. So we have, a, we have a 1916 Pierce Arrow touring car, model 38. It's a big car. He, he has good taste. Yeah, so we, so we went for a ride in that car. And, and during the ride, he said, you know, pop-up, this is my favorite car. I love this car. We have, we have Ferraris, Porsches, we have Corvettes. We have, and, he, and he wants a 16 Pierce Arrow. I, I said, well, happy birthday, Connor. It's your car. So I gave him the car that day, and it's his car now. Um, he has a trust with 15 cars in it, but he doesn't know it yet. So the, 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 that's his first car. We won't but, let him watch this video. But, but, but what's, what's so funny is, is that how he changes. And, and so we own a Porsche Speedster, 58 Speedster. And so we went to go out for a ride the other day, and uh, we're going to go to Cars and Coffee on Sunday morning. And I said, hey, let's take the Speedster. He goes, eh. I don't know. So what do you mean you don't know? He said, eh, can't we take a hot rod? We got that. I said, well, I guess we could, but what's wrong with the Speedster? I don't know. It's okay. I'd rather, I'd rather go on a hot rod. So we, 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 we went in a hot rod. And then the next weekend, I said, eh, we're going to go in the Speedster. I suppose if, if we have to. Anyway, a Porsche Speedster. But how it changes, you know, and, and now he's, he's telling me what, and I said, I suppose we're going to have to sell it then if you don't want, oh, not, maybe not sell it. I, I, I don't like, I don't dislike it that bad. So things change. Um, so, but uh, if just seeing a, a 10 year old and, and just trying to get him interested in it, that's the key. Have him sit in it and, and maybe start the engine, go for a ride. Those are the best things, you know, and let them touch it. Let them sit in it. I mean, you know, people, they get too wound up about, you know, don't touch my car. When I would be on the show and I'd be put my hands, you know, I'd lean against the car and people would write me, how can you touch a car? How can you show people that you touch a car? I go, it's a car. But I think, what, it's, not, it's not like the Mona Lisa. I mean, you know, if something happens to it, we'll fix it. If it was original, maybe that would be different. But um, I think that that's the, the best advice. Yeah. There you go. While you're waiting uh, to go back, we, all, we have a, a very famous person in the front row here with us tonight, uh, Judy Stropus. I want to recognize Judy. Judy. <laughs> Judy. Judy's a wonderful friend, and a lot of people don't know about her history, but um, she was the, the best timer and scorer in all, race, all, in, all the race worlds here in the United States before before computers and she and 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 she's got the bladder the size of a Buick yeah. and, the, and, the, and there's one other thing there's one other thing that people don't know about Judy Judy was the recipient of the Golden Turtle Award at the 2021 Turtle Invitational a highly coveted uh, award okay I'm traveling on my sound of Golden Turtle <laughs> it's all worries, but we can glue it back on, don't worry. So thanks, Judy. Thank you. Yeah, you, you, you're the best. Hi, Wayne. Thanks again for coming today, and thanks yeah. for speaking. Um, I had a question for you. Do you have any advice for any aspiring car collectors? You know, maybe any pitfalls or lessons to pass along that you've learned over the years? 
Well, just getting involved is the best lesson. So somebody says, hey, I'm, I'm saving my money because I want to buy a Z28 Camaro. Uh, maybe I can do that in, in the next five years. And I said, well, what about now? Well, I don't know. I said, why don't you go buy a car to show, it doesn't matter what it is. Buy a Pinto. And he goes, why a Pinto? I said, well, if you go to a car show, there's nothing wrong with Mustangs and Camaros, but there's probably 40 Mustangs, 30 Camaros, and there's no Pintos. But if you got an unusual car like a Pinto or an AMX or something like that, and you bring it to a car show, everybody wants to talk to you about your car because it's so unusual. So buy something that's unusual, then maybe buy the Z28 later. But getting into it, it's just being part of it. And the only way you can be part of it is to, is to get in with the, with the people and, and talk to them. And so the easy way is buying something weird and unusual. A station wagon, maybe. Thank you. Last question. Anyone? Yeah, I, I this. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> How I, well, <laughs> How do you balance? What? <laughs> how, how do you uh, balance life with you know family and doing that? Like, what's the secret in that? Because I always find that it's really hard. You know, I have little kids and everything, and I want to be there, but I also want to be here. And, you know, I'm not saying I'll uh, get, get with songs. So, what? What's my life? Well, I, you know, with the TV show, I was very lucky. My children had already grown up when when the show started. Um, so that was good. Uh, the key for me was having an understanding and loving wife um, that realized that, you know, this was very important to me. And um, people say, what's the, what's the secret of being married for 40 years? Uh, not seeing each other too often. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. Today she, she, she texted me. She goes, how many days will you be at Pebble this year? They said, what do you got up? So one year I went to Pebble and I came home and she had totally renovated the house, new furniture. <laughs> I mean, you know, she called me, you know, and I said, she's, when are you coming home? And it was Sunday at Pebble. I said, I think I'm coming home tomorrow. Oh, shouldn't you go to that party in Nevada <laughs> that you, don't, you miss every year? I said, well, yeah, that'd be kind of nice to do. Why don't you do that? Yeah, it's because the house is all ripped apart. Perfect. I think, I think that's all the time for questions. Before we break, I, I want to... I want to thank Wayne again. This has been really, really fun and, and, and very insightful and very revealing in your life. And I think there's, you're like an onion. There's so many levels and layers to your life and what you've built in an industry that there's very few people who, there's nobody, as I started with, who, who's become a television star globally in the automobile space and collector cars. And then also all you've done for people, re restoring cars and, and selling good cars to people. And it's just, it's something you should be really proud of your life and what you've done and what you've done for other people too and all the pictures and, and, uh, and I'm proud to know you. Um, we, we, we recognize Judy Stropis, but there's one other person in the audience I want to recognize and I know he won't like me for doing this, but my childhood friend and a great friend of our firm, McLean Ward, made the Olympic team last weekend and is going to Paris for show jumping. And I just, I just wanted to recognize that. Well, I, and I've got two other people, Lowell Paddock and Matt Strauss. Um, they helped me immensely. They helped me with a lot of my social media stuff. Matt and I, we do a lot of uh, video stuff together. But one of the best things is, and the reason I'm here is because of Philip. I, you know, Philip and I met a few years ago and we hit it off really well, but I, I think he's one of the best people and, and for his age, you're a very young guy. <laughs> but your enthusiasm and your, your expertise to detail and everything. And, and we had a great dinner at Pebble a, a, a few years ago. And, and, it, 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 and Phoebe was there too. Phoebe, you did a wonderful job. But it, it was, you get to know people a little bit better sitting around the table. And we had some really special guests at that, at that dinner too. And we, as I recall, we got interrupted in the middle of dinner by somebody who wanted their picture with Wayne. And Wayne <laughs> put down his fork and smiled. It, it actually it happened, yeah. It did happen. <laughs> it was a latecomer to the dinner party. Yeah. And they said, before you get up and leave, I need my picture taken. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So. I'd like to say that you did an outstanding job. Thank you, Jane. Interviewing Wayne. 
your your knowledge, your your transitions, your uh, questions, everything was outstanding. I think you need to put him on top. <laughs> I'm from Dank Studio. Thanks, everybody. Please, uh, please feel free to hang out and have a drink and talk and network, and as we do at the Hollowbrook Wealth Alliance. And and thanks for coming. Thanks, buddy. Thanks a lot. Yeah. It was really fun. It was fun. We hope you've enjoyed our presentation today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to our channel. To learn more about Wayne Carini, be sure to click the links below this video and check out his social media channels. Thank you again for watching from all of us here at Hollowbrook Wealth Management.